there in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, <clears throat> Manny has his PhD from political in political science and public policy from the University of Michigan. And before that is MPA from Cornell University. Uh, and we realized just in the course of our breakfast conversation this morning that we were at Cornell at the same time. And for all we know, we had classes together, but that's one of the things I like about academia is the world is smaller than you think all the time. Um, Manny is really well known for his work in many aspects of environmental policy, uh, particularly well known for some of his work on public utilities. And he's developed a bunch of uh, methods there to analyze the equitability and affordability of different rate structures. <clears throat> He's also the author of a <clears throat> well-known and widely cited book, I think published maybe in 2011, um, called Bureaucratic Ambition, which I commend to you. Uh, it talks about the various ways that career ambitions of um, agency administrators shape the, the mission and the activities of those, of those organizations over time. Today, what Manny's going to talk about is some of his uh, most recent work on uh, the bottled water industry and how it relates to um, uh, public policy issues, particularly trust in public institutions. So while Manny comes up, uh, I, I just want to note for those of you on Zoom, we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. Obviously, those of you who are here in the room could just raise your hand and you can raise your electronic hand if you're on Zoom or uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll monitor those as well. So Manny, welcome. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. I'm gonna see if this video look okay for y'all here in the room, not too, it's a little washed out. Yeah. Oh yeah, is there a way to do that? Is that too ah, for you? Right. better. Good. Good. Now I'm blinded, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't need to see anything. Uh, so thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the Water Resources Center for for inviting me to be part of this this uh, terrific series. This is not my first visit to the University of Minnesota, but it's my first visit to this campus. I had been over at the other one, closer to, to downtown, I think a few years ago for a conference. Um, and I have not really. I moved to to the University of Wisconsin in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. So I have not really been out much. Uh, so it's my first time uh, crossing the state lines since I've been in the upper Midwest here uh, most recently. Um, so I'm pleased to be here and I'm glad that, that, you know, that, that, that at least some of us are out of masks because it affirms what I had, had always known, which is that Minnesotans are strikingly attractive people. So it, it's, it's nice to have that affirmed. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and I am not above pandering to any audience, really. Uh, so but it, really, it is an honor to be part of the series. One of the things I, I like to do uh, it, when I, whenever I get invited, um, uh, fortunately, to be part of a series like this is I like to look at, nowadays, people have video, right? They can put YouTube videos up of the past talks, so you get a sense of what they're like, what kind of people they invite. And uh, th this series in particular has a nice website, has, has all the past lecturers, so you get a look at who's there. And it's an impressive variety of people. Uh, it's, an, it's, you know, it's a truly interdisciplinary group. The Water Resources Center clearly, clearly evidently a, an interdisciplinary uh, enterprise. And a lot of places talk a good game about interdisciplinarity. One of the things I've, I've noticed, especially with university water shops, is they'll say, well, we're in an inter interdisciplinary center. And what that really means is that the civil engineers will sometimes work with chemical engineers uh, and, and or, or, you know, maybe the wildlife biologists will work with the laboratory biologists or the cell biologists. But this is an actual interdisciplinary shop. And it, it's fun to see that when you look, you, that's evident in the, in the faculty, that's evident in the research that comes out of here. It's evident in this lecture series. So so thank you. Uh, it's, it's fun to be part of it. So my talk today uh, takes its title from a book that I, I wrote with uh, Samantha Zolke at uh, the University of Iowa. And uh, let me advance here. Samantha Zolke at the University of Iowa. There we go. And David Switzer at the University of Missouri. It's called The, the Profits of Distrust. Uh, the three of us put together, this, this book has a pretty strong Midwestern accent. Uh, but it, it's, it's a, 
Uh, I'm pleased to describe or to, to, to declare that the book's now forthcoming. It'll be out later this year from, from Cambridge University Press. Uh, if all goes according to plan, uh, it'll be available this summer electronically and in hard copy in the fall. So I'm, I'm going to be presenting in a fairly short period of time a whole book's worth of material, or as, as best as, as I can do in any case. Uh, and because this is a, an interdisciplinary audience, uh, I want to want to sort of give a, a general uh, overview, thought, a third caveat, uh, uh, an explanation of what I'm going to do. I'm going to be showing a lot of material. I'm going to be presenting a lot of stuff at a very high level, uh, and that's because I want to convey the whole book's worth of material in, in a very, very short talk, and that's all going to seem maybe a little shallow. So if this were more of an academic research talk, I might take one chapter or half a chapter's worth of material and really drill down into it, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to be going fast and kind of keeping things at, at, a, at a high level. Um, so I'll be glad to take uh, up any questions about methodology that you might have, or if you prefer, you can wait till the book comes out and look at the 60 pages of methodological appendices at the end of the book, and you can see all about measurement and estimation and all the other sort of stuff that we do in the book. So at one level, this talk or in the book, uh, both are about water. It's about the water we drink. It's about the utilities that provide us that water uh, service. It's about the regulatory agencies that oversee water systems. And it's about the commercial firms that sell bottled water and uh, water at, at commercial kiosks. But at a deeper level, this book and this talk are about the relationship between citizens and their government. It's about the institutions of democracy. And it's about the crisis of faith in democratic institutions that we're sort of living through at this moment. But I, it didn't start that way. This project, when it first started some years ago, back when I was at Texas A&M, it, it sort of started us down the path. Um, what started us down the path is really two graphs and a map. I'm gonna show you the graphs and the map. Here's the first graph. This is US bottled water sales, uh, excuse me, water production volume from 2001 through 2020. According to the International Bottled Water Association, Americans bought about 5.2 billion gallons of unflavored, non-carbonated bottled drinking water in 2001. So 5.2 5 billion gallons. That generated about $7 billion in wholesale revenue. That's not retail, it's wholesale revenue back in 2001. Over the next 20 years, the industry tripled to 15 billion gallons and $20 billion in wholesale revenue. And that translated into about $36 billion in retail sales last year. So that works out to about $25 each month for every household in the United States. To give you a sense of scale, that's a little over half of the total water utility revenue across the entire country. So that's how much money is going into the bottled water industry. Here's another way to, to kind of put things in terms of scale. Uh, just late last year, I'm sure everybody saw Congress passed an Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, better known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. That law uh, spent $55 billion over five years on drinking water infrastructure across the United States. And that is a large sum. $55 billion is a lot of money but Americans will spend three times as much money on bot bottled water over that period of time. So while politicians are sort of spiking the ball about how great this, this infrastructure law is and how much funding is going into it, the commercial water industry is going to generate a lot more revenue over the same period of time. So that's, that's graph number one. This is extraordinary growth. Now here's the map. This is a map of commercial drinking water kiosks in Houston, Texas. Uh, these are kiosks like this, this Watermill Express uh, that's pictured on, pictured on your screen. Uh, water kiosks are private automated vending machines that dispense drinking water in exchange for payment, usually either 25 or 35 cents a gallon. People come up to these kiosks, either drive up or sometimes they're in supermarkets. You've probably seen them. Uh, you insert your cash or your credit card and the machine gives you drinking water and you fill your own container with drinking water. The kiosks can be located, as I said, within buildings, or they can be freestanding, like this one. They're located in parking lots, mostly, often in front of dollar stores. Talk about that more in a moment. 
And like bottled water, these drinking water kiosks have proliferated across the United States over the last 20 years. Kiosks are very common in the developing world where tap water quality is very poor, service is unreliable, and sort of that sort of makes sense. This is a private sector solution to uh, safe drinking water. But we have seen lots of kiosks now in parts of the United States that have high quality tap water available. So they're parts of the United States with poor drinking water uh, service, but we're now seeing them more and more in major American cities like Atlanta, Phoenix, Denver, and uh, of course, Houston, places that have modern professionally operated uh, public water systems with excellent safety records. And yet we see a proliferation of these kiosks. Now, when I moved to Texas about 10 years ago, I had never seen these things before. I'd never seen a watermill express kiosk, but they're everywhere in Texas. They're very, very common. And I heard a talk by a geographer at, at Texas A&M named Wendy Jepson, and she, she gave a little talk about these things from sort of an ethnographic piece about the people who use them. And I was puzzled that people in a city like Houston, which has an excellent drinking water utility, would ever go and pay 35 cents a gallon to fill up at one of these things. And yet they're really very popular. So when I had a, a new graduate student named Samantha Zulke, uh, she wanted to come work with me, so I asked her to start looking into these things, and let's start figuring out where these things are. Now, neither Sam nor I are originally from Texas, and it's sort of a reminder that one of the gifts of living in a place where you did not grow up, with which you're unfamiliar, is you notice things that are weird that the people who live there don't notice. If you live in Texas, this is a, this is a common sight. This is not a weird thing to you, but you come from outside Texas, the Watermill Express seems weird. And so it, it, it sort of stands out and those, those local oddities uh, uh, became become a, a focus of research. So Sam developed a way to collect and effectively ground truth the locational data for these water kiosks using Google Street View. So with a, with a team of undergraduate researchers, we plotted the locations of every freestanding kiosk in the United States. Well, I should say the, the lower 48. Uh, we, we, uh, we used this team of researchers, we used Google Street View, and we plotted the locations for the two biggest companies, Watermill Express and another company called Ice House America, and we found thousands and thousands of them. First city we looked at was Houston, and we found uh, lots of them there. The presence of, of kiosks in Houston is puzzling, as I mentioned. Houston's got a very good drinking water utility. It's had perfect compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act since 1980. And it, its service didn't fail even in the middle of Hurricane Harvey. So it, we're talking about a very robust, high quality drinking water systems, uh, system rather. And if kiosks were related to tap water quality, well, we'd expect them to be sort of randomly distributed around the city because it's all one system. But that's not what we see, even just uh, eyeballing it, you can tell that those kiosks sort of cluster in, in particular spots. Well, the point, I'm going to come back to those clusters in just a, a few minutes here. The point is that just like bottled water, these kiosks are proliferating across the United States in ways that are sort of surprising because they're happening in major cities with high quality tap water. Okay, so that kind of growth would be surprising for any industry. Any industry that grows that fast should, should raise our eyebrows. But the rise of bottled water, commercial water more generally, is particularly striking because most Americans have access to a more carefully regulated, uh, often qualitatively superior, and always far less expensive alternative, and that is, of course, tap water. A case of Aquafina at Target or Walmart works out to about $2 a gallon. Some luxury brands of bottled water that you can find out there will sell for absurdly prices up to $100. Right? And you get some special artisanal mountain water from someplace. Right? By comparison, basic residential water and sewer prices in Houston, I had Houston up here a moment ago, Houston averages about 1.5 cents a gallon. In Cleveland, it's about 2 cents. Boston and Detroit, about 1.3 cents. In Memphis, Phoenix, Pasadena, Chicago, uh, a gallon of residential water service costs less than a penny. Here's how uh, the, the cost of tap water, excuse me, the cost of drinking water breaks down here in Minneapolis. So Minneapolis's water utility, about one cent a gallon. It's actually a little bit under one cent a gallon. Uh, kiosk, the Primo kiosk at the supermarket that you see, 35 cents a gallon and Aquafina about two bucks a gallon. The bottled water, you know, tap water quality in the United States 
is regulated by state and federal environmental agencies under the Safe Drinking Water Act, which requires regular testing, oversight, and so on, obliges water utilities to report water quality problems to the public. And one of the reasons we know so much about problems with drinking water utilities in the United States is that they're required to report this stuff. You know, they're required to take tests and report them on them. The bottled water quality in the United States is very lightly regulated by comparison. It's regulated by the FDA. And in, in principle, they're supposed to follow the same rules as the Safe Drinking Water Act, but there is no public reporting requirement for water quality for bottled water. And as far as we can tell, water kiosks are effectively unregulated. They claim that they're using reverse osmosis, most of them, but we don't really know. It's a black box, right? The water comes in from the municipal supply, water comes out. If it's reverse osmosis, there's gotta be effluent somewhere. Uh, we don't really know what's going on in these, these kiosks. Uh, and so uh, of course, then when we think about bottled water, multiple studies have found that when tested, bottled water often fails to meet Safe Drinking Water Act requirements. There's a problem of microplastic contamination frequently. And then of course, there's the environmental impact of the bottles themselves and the fuel spent moving uh, water bottles around. So we're talking about an environmentally destructive, ex extremely expensive and lightly regulated product. But things get even more curious. Let's go back to Houston for a second here. Here's, that, here's those same kiosks again. Uh, and as I said, we, we, we noticed that they're sort of clustered in different spots. Here's the same kiosks clustered over census tract median income. So in this picture, darker green is wealthier, uh, lighter green is lower income. So higher and lower incomes, lighter colors are light, uh, lower incomes, darker colors are higher income. So what you can see even with a cursory glance at this map is that the kiosks are in poorer neighborhoods. Uh, there are hardly any of them in wealthier neighborhoods. So what's going on here? Why are, what are, what's causing people to buy this much more expensive product? It's environmentally destructive, lightly regulated, dubious quality, instead of the more rigorously regulated and vastly less expensive tap water. Well, we think the answer is in the, the, the last graph. This is that same commercial water industry growth, that bottled water industry uh, growth uh, line. Over that uh, same period of time, that remarkable rise of the commercial water industry has come during a period of declining trust in American government. According to the Pew Research Center, the share of American, Americans who trust government to do what's right always or most of the time fell from 49% in 2001. Doesn't that seem kind of amazing? 49% of Americans trusted the government to do what's right in, in, in 2001 fell from 49% to about 18% over the last few years. That is an unprecedented 30 point drop. And Pew has been asking some version of this question since the 1950s. So this, this, we've never seen a drop like that. Uh, and in fact, the, the folks who are as specialists on public opinion tell us that the reason that it hasn't dropped further, this is about as low as that they can get anyone to, to say that you know, they, they distrust something. I mean, you get, to get lower than that, you're talking about terrorists or you know, Congress. Right? So <laughs> this is very low trust. So these two lines obviously run in opposite directions with eerily similar long-term trends. So they, over this period of time, the bottled water volume uh, fell, rose by an average about 5.5% annually. Trust in government fell about 5.5% annually. So this has been a long windup, but the pitch is that we want to argue that these two lines are not coincidental. These are, these are not coincidences. There's a relationship between these, these two lines. And we think that the water Americans choose to drink reveals something fundamental about their relationship with the governments that, uh, that govern our, the water systems and govern uh, society at large. Now we are the, hardly the first to draw a connection between drinking water systems and government legitimacy. Historians like John Tiefer, David Saul, have shown that American political development is in many ways the story of water infrastructure development. In the 19th century and the early 20th century, American water utilities earned reputations, well-earned reputations, for reliable, high-quality, potable drinking water. The rise of water systems and sanitary sewers eradicated waterborne diseases that had ravaged civilization for centuries. Uh, the, the, the American, water, American water utilities 
leapt well ahead of every other uh, country in, in Europe uh, during this period of time, late 19th and early 20th century, in the availability of drinking water systems and sanitary sewer. Now, politicians in America built the party system as they built these water systems. Far more than just utilitarian, water supply facilities were testaments to civic achievement. Which is why when you look at the, the uh, water infrastructure built during this period of time, it's monumental architecture. It, these are signals to the public. Look what the politicians have brought you. One of my favorite examples of this, I go to it all the time, is, uh, here it is, Saginaw, Michigan. This is the drinking water treatment plant in Saginaw, Michigan. This thing was opened in 1929. And when the, the, uh, the drinking water plant opened, there was, uh, there was a big celebration and top hatted politicians came together and made speeches and held citywide celebrations. Here's a picture, there's, a, there's three, three gentlemen here. One of them is the, the governor of Michigan. One of them is the mayor of Saginaw. I've never figured out who the third fellow is. And I'm gonna tell you in just a second what they're doing. They're, they're standing right in front of a hole and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this in just a second. But when they opened this treatment plant, they had a parade. And the whole town turned out. Uh, here's a here's a picture of the parade. I think it was marching bands and so on. And what's what what you see here in the picture? This is a hearse. And there's some Boy Scouts marching alongside the hearse. And in the hearse is a coffin. And in the coffin is a hand pump. Because this is how the people of Saginaw used to get their drinking water. They had a hand pump on the street corner, so they'd have to go out and pump the water. And so what the gentlemen were doing in the picture up there is, uh, is they're ceremonially burying the hand pump into the foundation of the drinking water treatment plant. This, my friends, is what political scientists would call a credit claiming opportunity for a politician. Politicians then, like politicians now, like to claim credit for good things. And you don't get a whole lot better than bringing potable tap water into people's homes when what they're used to doing is going out in the middle of winter and using a hand pump to get the water for their homes. So that scene repeated itself across the country in the 19th and early 20th century. The drinking water systems were constructed across the United States, places like New York and Chicago, Miami, Seattle. Reservoirs, water towers, and treatment plants were monuments to the social value of drinking water. Water infrastructure improved life very immediately and very tangibly inspiring confidence in governments, uh, that the, the governments that created them. So just as in the ancient Roman Empire, aqueducts and sewers brought health, prosperity, and thriving uh, economy to American cities, simultaneously sending powerful signals and serving as reminders of the state's political genius. What's more, drinking water is the most basic of basic services. Water that flows from the taps is the most intimate relationship between people and their government. This is a, a service that governments, often governments themselves, send directly into our homes. We cook with it. We submerse our children in it. We take it into our bodies. There's nothing else government produces that we ingest, right? This is a government service that we ingest. Now, a central tenet, arguably the central tenet of democratic theory, is that the legitimacy of any government rests on its ability to secure its people's basic needs and you don't get any more basic than water. And it's, it's, it's right there in Locke and Rousseau in the Declaration of Independence. It's difficult to imagine any government maintaining its legitimacy without providing safe drinking water. So the meteoric rise of commercial drinking water implies that a significant share of Americans don't trust whatever's coming out of their tap. A raft of data uh, from different studies show that there's a strong positive correlation between household income and perceived tap water quality. Let me say that a different way. The higher your income, the better you perceive your tap water. Lower income people tend to perceive tap water quality to be poor. Higher income people tend to perceive tap water to be good, even where rich and poor are getting water from the same place. So the other remarkable thing about commercial water demand is that trust in tap water is low among low-income people and is also low among Blacks and Hispanics compared with non-Hispanic whites. 
Our own data, Sam and David and I confirm again what a raft of other uh, studies have shown, which is that Blacks and Hispanics are roughly twice as likely to drink bottled water uh, instead of tap water compared to non-Hispanic whites. So somewhat counterintuitively, the poorest Americans spend the most on drinking water. The richest Americans spend the least on drinking water. So mistrust of tap water leads co uh, consumers to do what economists call defensive spending. It's spending to avoid some kind of risk. People perceive a risk to their tap water, so they're willing to spend exorbitantly on commercial alternatives. Distrust of public water utilities then is central to the growth model of commercial water firms. That's my claim, but I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's listen to what the commercial water industry says. This is an advertisement on a Primo kiosk. I took, I took this picture uh, outside a supermarket. And the appeal to fear is right there. It's not very subtle. But it gets, it gets even better. Uh, in Primo's filing, I want to take, back, take, take one more moment to point out. This is a picture I took uh, outside the supermarket in Houston in a neighborhood that had never had a Safe Drinking Water Act violation in the last 45 years. So we're, we're talking about a, a neighborhood with very high quality tap water, and yet the appeal to fear is right there. Now, it's also a neighborhood with a lot of Hispanic residents, so there's something going on there as well. But again, I want to talk about the growth model here. Uh, Primo's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, told its investors, uh, quoting here, we intend to capture new customers as we capitalize on favor consu favorable consumer trends across our addressable markets, including increased focus on health and wellness and concerns about deteriorating municipal water quality. This is what Primo told its investors. Concerns about deteriorating municipal water quality is why our firm is going to grow. It's why your investment is a good one. It's funny, is in the same filing, when they have to tell, talk about the, the potential threats to their market, ironically, they say one of the threats is deteriorating municipal water quality. And the reason is, of course, that Primo's source water is municipal tap water. <laughs> Which brings us back to trust in government and the heart of our argument. Citizens are also consumers. Most consumers are also citizens. So the choices that people make about drinking water at some level are political, especially in the United States where 85% of Americans get their drinking water from a government. And 100% of Americans who get tap water service from a utility uh, are receiving service that's supposed to be regulated by government. To trust tap water is to trust government. To distrust tap water is to distrust government. And the same might be said for firefighting or roads or food safety or law enforcement or any of the other basic services that government provides. But water, as I said, is perhaps the most basic of basic services. So, Theoretically, here's what we think is happening. We think that what happens is uh, there's some kind of a basic service failure, or at least a perceived basic service failure. Failure can be real or perceived, it can be immediate or distant, it can be in my neighborhood, it can be someplace across the country, it can affect me personally, or it can affect people who are like me somewhere else. But that failure erodes trust in government, not only uh, not only in the service, but also in the institutions that govern it and or regulate it. That leads consumer, citizen consumers to a exit voice decision or, or, or voice decision. Increased consumer exit will follow. People who have lost trust will, will exit uh, the, the public service for a commercial service. This is a, a famous argument from a guy named Albert Hirschman. Uh, you have a choice when you're dissatisfied with your service provided by government. You can either try to use your voice, try to get government to change and improve services, or you can exit. Well, the trouble with voice is it takes a lot of time, effort, and resources to try and lobby the government to do something better. And the other is that you could spend all those time and resources, and then maybe the government wouldn't do anything for you. So it's sometimes more rational, says Hirschman, to exit for a commercial alternative because even though it's much more expensive, it provides me with a certain outcome. So loss of trust leads us to increased uh, exit for commercial alternatives. 
That exit to, for commercial alternatives uh, is, it turns out to be in many cases, the most rational outcome, especially for people who distrust government. So the distrustful will stop using the government service and spend defensively. Case of drinking water, that means they'll buy tap water. That's gonna to lead to reduced overall political participation. What, what would say less voice, less voice from the citizen consumer. That's a side effect of exit to the commercial, uh, in, the commercial sector. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. People who distrust government have little reason to engage with it. Why do I spend my time participating in a political process that I think is dominated by evil or corrupt people? Or people who dislike me or people of my racial or ethnic group. It doesn't make any sense for me to try to persuade you to do something if you hate me or if I believe you hate me. Moreover, once I've already exited for the commercial alternative, I'm already, I've already decided to spend my money elsewhere. There's no point in me engaging further with the government. That in turn reduces the incentives for government and its officials to perform better. Political institutions and democracies are set up to respond to citizen voice. That's what, that's what they're good at. They don't respond well to market signals like, like consumer behavior. They do respond very well to political signals. But if the dissatisfied consumer has exited the political process, that reduces the incentive for government to respond with better service. And of course, that leads to more service failures and we enter a vicious cycle. So here's what that vicious cycle of basic services looks like for, for water. If there's some tap water failure, reduces trust in government, increased commercial consumption, uh, water, uh, consumption of commercial water, uh, reduced citizen participation, reduced incentives and resources for utilities and regulators, and that will lead to further tap water problems. Now in the book, we marshal an array of data on consumer behavior, public opinion, water quality, market, uh, uh, market data, dozens of statistical models, uh, more than 300 pages of ink spilled on essentially this argument. We're just gonna walk through every part of it. And so now uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be sharing some highlights of those findings on every step along this cycle. Before I launch into that, this is still a university talk. So, I need to, uh, to give the, the uh, methodological uh, uh, caveat here. The argument that my co-authors and I advance here is inherently endogenous. It's literally a cycle. Right? This is a cyclical argument. Our empirical subject really defies the kind of research design that would allow us to declare definitively that any one of these things absolutely causes any of the other things. Uh, for reasons that we hope are obvious, we can't randomly assign contaminated tap water to different people and see how they react, or, or randomly disenfranchise certain people from the political process and see how they react with their tap water behavior. We can't do those things. So we're working with observational data. Uh, we do have a few quasi-experiments in the book, uh, that, and we're going to talk about one of them. But if experimental design and, and strict causal identification are your thing, you're, you're really going to be dissatisfied with most of what I'm going to show you. But we hope that taken together, all of, all of the findings we do have are at least suggestive uh, of this kind of relation, this cyclical relationship uh, and, and worthy of contemplation. So we're going to start at the top with tap water failure and, uh, and reduced trust in government. When tap water fails, it's really unlike virtually any other failure of, of government products or services. It shakes people's faith in the legitimacy of government itself. That they, I mean, I'm gonna start off by showing you some data from a survey we ran at Texas A&M in, in 2015 called the Nexus Survey. It's a national, uh, rep nationally representative sample, about 1,500 US residents. And I think this is useful because it happened before the Flint water crisis. Uh, 20, late 2015, uh, Americans started to think differently about tap water because Flint kind of put, put it into the national spotlight. So early in the survey, we asked people to rate their trust in government at the state, federal, and local levels on a scale of zero to 10. 10, I trust completely, zero, I don't trust at all or distrust completely. And then later we asked them whether they had experienced different kinds of problems with their 
uh, tap water in the homes where they currently live. And our aim was to see whether people's experiences with tap water shaped their trust in government. And boy, howdy, were we right. So you trust in local government was markedly lower for people. And we see the same thing, by the way, for, for state and federal. I'm showing you local because local governments are usually the providers of tap water. But trust in local government is markedly lower for people whose tap water tastes bad, is dirty or cloudy, suffers from low pressure, or when people believe it makes them sick. And those relationships hold and they actually get stronger when you control for age, race, partisanship, and so on. Uh, it's something like a 10 to 25% reduction in trust in local government for people who have tap water problems. This is, this is a, the plot here is on our 10 point scale. They might look at that and think, well, okay, I mean, that's, that's a statistically significant difference, but, but what we're really talking about is, is less than a point on a 10 point scale. Maybe, so maybe that's, maybe that's not that big a deal. But I want to give that some context. The difference in trust between people who have and have not experienced tap water problems is about the same as the difference in, of trust in government between Republicans and Democrats. So the effect here is roughly similar to partisanship. Here's a plot of, of uh, trust in local government as a function of partisanship for people who have had, who think their tap water tastes bad and people who don't think their tap water tastes bad. So people who, uh, who think their tap, tap water tastes fine, it's kind of the relationship we would expect. On average, Republicans distrust uh, uh, government more and, and Democrats trust government more. But for people who have bad taste in tap water, there's really effectively no difference. So the way to think about this is uh, tap, bad tap water or perce a perception of bad tap water will make a Democrat feel about government the way a Republican feels about government. It's, it's that has that kind of a, a powerful effect. That brings us to the choice of exit to commercial water. Here's some data from a different survey. This is the 2018 Cooperative Congressional Election Survey. Again, about a thousand Americans. We asked them early about trust in local, state, and federal government. And then later they were asked about their, whether they drink bottled water or tap water. Once again, the results are pretty dramatic. People who distrust government, much more likely to drink bottled water instead of tap water. On average, people who don't trust the federal government are 13% likelier to drink bottled water. Uh, the gap is about 11% for state and local government. So at every level, distrust in government is associated with exit from tap water in favor of commercial water. But of course, distrust of government is not randomly distributed across the population, and neither is that exit. One of really, uh, the graphs I've been showing you so far are all about bottled water. Uh, and, but I wanna talk about kiosks for a second. The, the really great thing about kiosks in an analytical sense is that they are standalone structures. Right. They're fixed in geographic space. So if somebody sells out some bottled water, we can maybe draw some inferences about who's buying it based on where it's sold, but not really. Uh, can, that bottled water could go anywhere. The great thing about kiosks is, is that they're, they're fixed in space. They're also typically run as franchises, meaning that local demand has to exist in order for some investor to spend the money to put this facility in place. So we can think of them as sort of spatial lightning rods for commercial drinking water demand. So consistent with existing research on bottled water, we find that these, that these kiosks cluster in, in areas that have low socioeconomic status. Uh, so it, it, what we've got here is, is a plot shows spatial locations of kiosks, uh, a standardized metric of socioeconomic status, which is a function of income and, and education. And we get very low, uh, socioeconomic status, you have a higher number of kiosks, and, and these very wealthy uh, communities have virtually no kiosks at all. Very, very uh, low. That These are based on national data. I'm showing you maps of Houston. So that dramatic downward slope shows that, you know, commercial water is not a luxury good. It's, it's consumed mainly by the poor. So you, you weren't hallucinating when you saw that pattern in Houston earlier. Uh, what's more, the exit for commercial drinking water is far higher for racial and ethnic minority communities, uh, along with analysis of bottled water consumption. Uh, we found that the, the commercial water kiosks are also disproportionately in, uh, in Black and especially Hispanic neighborhoods. Again, here's back to Houston. Uh, spatial econometric analysis confirms what your eyeballs are telling you. 
uh, and that these things aren't random, that they tend to cluster in black and especially Hispanic neighborhoods. Distrust has an ethnic accent. Finally, when we examine the, uh, uh, the, the um, location of kiosks across the US, unsurprisingly, we find that kiosks correlate with poor tap water quality. Places that have had uh, Safe Drinking Water Act violations tend to have kiosks. Places that haven't had uh, Safe Drinking Water Act uh, violations tend to have fewer of them, but there are still some. There's still some there. That finding is unhappy, but not terribly surprising. The thing that's maybe more surprising is that using spatial uh, econometrics again, we examined the effect of a community's own Safe Drinking Water Act violations and other communities' Safe Drinking Water Act violations. So it's not what's going on in my community, but what's going on in neighboring communities, what's going on in communities across the country. And we defined neighbors in different ways. Sam did some really cool analysis in which we define neighbors first spatially, the way you sort of intuitively think of it. Then we also ran some analyses where neighbors were defined in terms of their, their socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic similarities. In other words, I'm not just looking at who's spatially proximate to me, but which communities are ethnically similar to mine, racially similar to mine, socioeconomically similar to mine. One of the things we show in the book, I don't have a slide for you, is that uh, drinking water, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 lead testing in Providence, Rhode Island, spiked after the Flint water crisis. You know, the Flint water crisis hits, hits the news, and then Providence water, interest in lead testing goes way up uh, just like a month later. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so anyway, when you would define neighbors based on identity, here's how, how things shake out. This is the effect on the estimated number of kiosks. Uh, these are the direct effects. There was, in my community, how to say drinking water act violation. And here's what happens in neighbors. Maybe the surprising finding here is that the effects of what's going on in the neighboring communities is actually stronger than what's happening locally. We think that consumers are hyper optic. They see what's happening farther away more than they see what's happening close up. Here's the effect for based on neighbors, based on socioeconomic similarity, based on racial similarity, uh, somewhat less on, on ethnic similarity. So we divide, a, we think that um, social environment then is a more important, is a more social similarity, social environment is a more important predictor than the physical environment or immediate uh, effects that are driving commercial water demand. And we devote an entire book of our chapter to tracing the legacies of institutional bias that we think are underlying these, these effects. People who feel alienated from government are likely to exit. Uh, we, we analyze uh, the American South uh, in the Appalachia, uh, the desert Southwest and different kinds of communities that are alienated in different parts of the country. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna cover all of those, but I'm gonna show you one though, because it's kind of neat, sort of a quasi experiment. We look at North Carolina, where an accident of history gives us a unique opportunity to see how political institutions drive uh, consumer behavior. When the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, some counties, most, most states were either brought entirely under the Voting Rights Act or not. They were subject to direct oversight by the Department of Justice. North Carolina is the only state where some counties were covered by the, the, the Voting Rights Act, some counties were not. So that presents us with sort of a natural experiment to examine how political protections correlate with bottled water sales. So it turns out that after controlling for a host of demographic and, and economic variables, uh, that, that protection for minority voting rights back in the late 1960s uh, correlate with bottled water sales today. So counties that were uh, not covered by the Voting Rights Act spend significantly more on bottled water and that's again after controlling for population, race, socioeconomic status. And that translates on one level, you know, again, in dollar value, this is not big, it's less than a dollar per household per year. But a couple of things to think about that less than dollar. That dollar is not randomly distributed. It's poor and minority families that are spending those dollars. And collectively, it works out to something like five and a half million dollars in extra annual income for the commercial water industry in the Tar Heel State because political, because the, the counties uh, where 
uh, where, where voting rights aren't protected uh, create this kind of political alienation. So defensive spending, we think, is a habit of the politically alienated. And the result is that the profits of distrust are reaped not from the powerful and the wealthy, but rather from the poor and the powerless. So commercial water firms have good reasons to rub raw the sores of distrust. And they hint darkly that tap water is tainted. Uh, marginalized people are receptive to their claims. So commercial water companies give special marketing attention to black and Hispanic communities. Commercial water firms uh, will sometimes do that explicitly, sometimes subtly. Okay, so that's exit. I wanna talk about voice. We found lots of interesting stuff here uh, about the relationship between bottled water consumption and political participation. Uh, I'm gonna show you just one thing. Again, in the CCES, we asked respondents whether they engaged in various forms of political participation. Political science says it's a typical battery of political participation questions. Did you attend a local meeting, put up a bumper, uh, put up a sign or bumper sticker, work for a campaign, attend a demonstration, contact a public official? This is sort of your, your, your usual suspects of political participation. It turns out that bottled water drinkers are significantly less engaged in politics than tap water drinkers, and that's after controlling for gender, income, race, ethnicity, and partisanship. Same thing shows up when we look at voter turnout, electoral participation. So exit from drinking water, uh, from collective drinking water is also associated with a broader withdrawal from civic life. That's all troubling. But the thing is, we don't think any of this stuff is crazy. We think that all of these findings are consistent with rational behavior by both citizens and firms. So if you don't trust government, it's always more rational to exit than to try to use voice. And if you are, it, rather than participating in politics where uh, you know, you're uncertain what's gonna happen and maybe distrustful of the institutions themselves, you go to the commercial sector, uh, accountability declines, public officials have less reason to invest in water systems, the systems deteriorate, trust declines further, cycle continues. That's all very dismal news. Let me talk about the good news now. The good news is that this cycle can also be virtuous. Vicious cycle can also be virtuous. If citizens perceive high quality service and recognize that that service is brought to them by governments, then they come to trust government. Citizens who trust government are less likely to exit for the commercial sector uh, and are more likely to drink tap water. Citizens who drink tap water are more likely to demand higher quality tap water and will be willing to invest to, to support politicians who invest in higher quality tap water and in turn governments, as I said, democratic governments attuned to voter preferences, if citizen preferences. So governments then will respond by regulating rigorously and providing excellent service. That's the argument. And in fact, that's what we see happen. People who trust their tap water are willing to pay for it. Uh, we, we, uh, there was a, a survey, we used another survey source, a thing called the Value of Water Survey from the US Water Alliance. Survey asked the respondents whether they drank tap water or bottled water, and then also whether they would support rate increases to provide uh, improved service. And uh, you can imagine this going either way, right? If I'm unhappy with my tap water service, I could say, well, yes, I have support a rate increase if it means I'm going to get better service. Or I could say no, because I don't trust the institution to use my money wisely, that they won't be good stewards of my resources. Uh, and so when we, we look at the data, here's what we find. Support for, for rate increases is stronger among tap water drinkers. People who drink tap water are more likely to support, more willing to support a rate increase. So when utilities and citizens, uh, the citizens that they serve have that trusting relationship, it pays off in the form of more resources for the utilities and better tap water for the people. We then also see uh, increased water utility performance as citizen participation increases. Uh, here's an analysis of relationship between Safe Drinking Water Act uh, compliance or, or rather violations and voter turnout in California. Uh, communities that have a higher voter, voter turnout will have, uh, have, have fewer Safe Drinking Water Act violations 
Uh, and again, that's after controlling for the usual suspects of, of uh, demog demographic and, and scale suspects that we'd expect associated with safe drinking water violations. Okay. I wanna wrap up with what all this means, both for water and for democracy. As I said, the modern American state was in many ways forged with the concrete and steel that built water and sewer systems. The tangible improvements that followed from those systems lent credibility to claims by politicians that the democratic state could make life better. Now that all happened in the late 19th and early 20th century. In the early 21st century, Faith in the protective state edifice is crumbling, it's shaking. This trust at the tap contributes to what we see more broadly as a generalized distrust in government, both in America and in other democracies. The burgeoning crisis of legitimacy besetting democratic government really around the world has emerged in large part because citizens no longer believe that government provides a better life. And the rise of commercial drinking water in the United States in that sense is a symptom of the broader erosion of trust in governance across the country. Water bottles on a conference table in a city that has high quality tap water sends a signal to the, attendant, to the attendees of that meeting. It says that that, that tap water is, is bad, and private, or at least that commercial private water is better. A water kiosk on a city street in a community that has uh, a good tap water system is a, is a physical manifestation of that same kind of distrust. You think about the signals, that monumental architecture that we associate with water, those signals sense, that, that, those, that, that architecture sends a signal. You see a, a beautiful water tower. Hey, here in Flyover America, we love our water towers. That sends a signal to, some, to the community, some kind of a collective value. A kiosk sends a, a signal too, but it sends a very different kind of signal. It, it, it tells us that, uh, that tap water is bad. Uh, a water kiosk is isolated. It's isolating. It's, this is not a landmark of, uh, of, of collective identity. It's a landmark of alienation. Oh, what by yourself, you fill the water tank jug by yourself and you leave. The profits of distrust then that flow to commercial companies, they drag down the economy, they exploit the poor, they pollute the environment. But more than all that, they also erode our social and civic life. But because that vicious cycle can be virtuous too, tap water also holds the potential to establish or reestablish trust in government. Governments to, to address that distrust then must he attack head on basic service problems. And again, you don't get any more basic than water, especially in the we, governments have to address inequities that currently leave poor and minority communities full served. So the message I wanna leave you with then is that rebuilding trust in governance institutions in America has to start with literal rebuilding, literal rebuilding of these systems. As I noted at the outset of my talk, uh, you know, these water systems are, are in many ways the, the bedrock of any, uh, water systems and, and drinking water are the bedrock of any civilization. Drinking water and sanitary sewers aren't like curing cancer. They're not like global climate change. They're not like nuclear proliferation. These are problems that we know how to solve. We know how to identify them. We've got legions of clever engineers who now know how to treat our water and keep our environment safe. These basic services are not glamorous, but getting them right demonstrates to citizens that to, democ uh, to citizens that democracy can still fulfill the promise of a better life. So we think that healthier tap water can make a healthier republic. And that's it. Am I on? Am I on time? Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. We did the, the nominal schedule for this is that we would uh, end at noon and I if people have things scheduled um, that they need to be to you can uh, you can head that way uh, that whether you're leaving electronically or in this room. But we can certainly take a few more minutes for questions I, I know there's already a few that have uh, rolled in on uh, on zoom 
So maybe if it's okay with you, Manny, I'll, I can just let sure. you moderate call on people in the room and then we'll chime in with some of the, the yeah. uh, Zoom questions. You bet. Sure, I don't like Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, transparency. Yeah. Does it improve trust or reduce trust? Because we want to increase people's concern about why 